As, as we're looking through the story, we're looking through this idea that you and I were made by God for more than our life sometimes appears. See, sometimes in our life we think that what we're made for is all of our brokenness. We identify with the things we've done and we live in shame and regret and we beat ourselves up for the things we once did that we can no longer go and undo. And sometimes we identify ourselves by our doubt. I want to believe, but I just simply can't. I want to trust, but I find it really difficult. Today, as we explore the story of Joseph, you'll see that we were made for more than our situations. There are days and there are times when things are really dark. There are days and there are times when everything seems against us. But we were made to shine as a light in that darkness for all to see. How do we do this? Well, sometimes when bad things happen, we begin to identify who we are based on what has happened to us. Maybe you can relate. See, when somebody hurts you and comes against you and bad stuff happens, sometimes we think, I deserve this. And we take whatever bad thing is happening, the death we're experiencing, the sickness we're suffering, the broken relationship, we say, it's all my fault. And we begin to say, there's no hope because I simply am terrible. If you've never been there, you're lucky. See, when you begin to see all the bad that happens in your life as your fault, it begins to eat away and you say, I am worthless and meaningless and there's nothing I can ever do that's good. What's the point of continuing to try? Sometimes our situations become so overwhelming that instead of seeing our responsibility, instead of blaming ourselves, we blame everybody else. It's their fault. They did this to me. I wouldn't be the way I am if you weren't so mean to me. I wouldn't act the way I act if that person hadn't done that thing to me so many years ago. The problem with blaming ourselves for every bad thing is sometimes bad things just simply happen. Sometimes you can do everything right and still experience loss and suffering. My wife and I, a couple years ago, had a miscarriage. And though I knew it wasn't true, during the grief and the pain and the loss, this question came to mind, could we have done something different? Like, should you have eaten something different or, or taken different vitamins? Or is there any way we could have prevented this? There wasn't. At the same time, when we play the victim and we say, it's all your fault, you caused this, we say there's no responsibility whatsoever. Maybe you've met somebody who plays the victim. No matter how bad things get, it's never something they have done. It's always everybody else's fault. Do you like being around those people? See, the real difficulty is when we identify ourselves by our bad situations and we say, I did this to myself, we begin to be filled with regret and hate for ourselves, And when we be begin to blame everybody else and play the victim, we begin to hate everybody else and we stop trusting them and we see that they're the problem. So if I just build a bigger wall, I'll be safer from them. And when we build that emotional wall, we find ourselves alone and hurting all the more. But you see, our situations don't always sometimes try to define us when things are going bad. Sometimes when things are going really good, we like to take credit for it too. We like to say, well, I deserve this. I am worth this. I have earned this. I've worked really, really hard. This is all me. You ever been in that place or met that person, the self-made man? Nobody's a self-made man. They may have worked really hard and done the right things and met the right people, but everybody is relying on somebody else around them in some measure. And the problem is when we begin to go through really good times and we take all the credit and we say, this is all my doing, we isolate ourselves from everybody else. You're going through a bad time? Well, fix yourself. Things aren't good? Just change your attitude. You're wondering why you're broke all the time? Well, get a different job, you bum. And we begin to look at everybody else as the problem. 
If only they could be like me, then they would be where I'm at. But unfortunately, really good people go through really bad times. And really bad people experience really great times. In the story of Joseph, he experiences all kinds of pain. See, God gives him as a teenager these dreams. And he dreams that his brothers all bow down before him one day. And as one of the younger brothers, how many of you have younger siblings? And your younger siblings, if they were to say to you today, someday you're going to work for me and I'm going to be your boss. Now, maybe you work for your sibling. You're like, well, that's already real life. It's not a fun place to be, right? I guarantee my older sisters, if I was like, someday I'll be better than all of you, they would not take that too lightly. Joseph's brothers didn't either. He told them about this dream and they plotted to kill him. Betrayed by his brothers, they sold him into slavery and told his dad that he was dead. Man, I definitely don't want to go through those dark times. If you've ever been betrayed by somebody you love, you know that betrayal cuts deep. I read earlier today that when we're cut deep and wounded, if we don't allow for healing to happen, we begin to bleed on everybody who never cut us. And that kind of struck with me. I was like, man, so often my hurt and the way I lash out and the way I act out comes from places that I should have resolved with God long ago. But I didn't, and I'm still carrying this burden and this baggage. Imagine that pain for Joseph of betrayal. He gets sold into slavery. He goes to a foreign land, and then something incredible happens. He gets elevated to the position of authority above everyone else. But the master's wife takes notice and starts to pursue him. What I love about Joseph as a man is he's one of very few characters in the scripture in all of the Bible that we see very little character flaws in, which makes him a little hard for me to relate to because I know I've got quite a long list of character flaws. But Joseph, day after day, is approached by this woman making advances that are not good that he refuses to give in to until he finds himself in a situation where he's trapped. Maybe in your life you've been in situations where you've been trapped. And there's no really good way to get out of the situation. And you know, whatever decision you make, it's going to be bad. And now what? And Joseph flees and the woman uses the opportunity as a chance to blame him. Look at what he tried to do. And being betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery, he's then thrown into prison for a crime he never committed be really easy to live Joseph's life and begin to get pretty bitter. God, where are you in all of this? Why don't you care about me? You made these great promises, and yet everything's going poorly. Maybe you've been there. I've been there. In times that are really painful and really hurting, I cry out to God, God, I thought you said, I thought you would do. I'm innocent here. Everybody needs to know that I'm innocent. The reality is when we try to promote ourselves and prove the truth, we usually just end up looking like the jerk people thought we were anyway. And it doesn't actually help our cause. Joseph's thrown into prison. He, in prison, is then forgotten about. Uh, He interprets some dreams, says, hey, when you get restored to power, Uh, make sure they come and rescue me and bring me out because I'm innocent. And then he's forgotten and sits in prison longer. And he could have begun to identify himself and his pain and said, my brothers did this to me. Pharaoh or Potiphar's wife did this to me. God himself did this to me. Woe is me. But he doesn't. We don't actually see what he does, but we know from what comes later that he handles himself in a way that many of us would not do naturally. We know that he handles himself in a way that changes everything. See, there comes a day after years and years of suffering where everything's going wrong, where he could have given up and said, I'm the victim here, where he could have given up and said, I deserve this. Look at how terrible I am. Where he could have given up and said, who cares? It doesn't matter anyway. Pharaoh finds himself in need. 
And Pharaoh comes to him and says, interpret this dream. What does it mean? And he does and gets elevated to this place of authority. It says, only with respect to the throne will I, Pharaoh, be greater than you. Can you imagine being in that place and wondering, what would come of my brother's? Can you imagine being in that place where suddenly life is going well after a whole season of bad stuff, where dark times are overwhelming you, and that light inside of you you thought was going out, but when that light wasn't going out, suddenly you're in this place of power. It's really tempting when things begin to go well to look on all who cause things to go bad and want revenge. Joseph doesn't. His brothers come to them. His brothers come before him and, and they're asking him for food and he recognizes them. And this is what it says. When he reveals who he is to them, after the season of testing to make sure they've changed, he reveals himself. And in Genesis chapter 45, it says this. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been a famine in the land. For the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph sees his brothers, and he's now in a place to make them pay and suffer for what they had done to him. But instead, he says to them, look, peace be with you. Don't you see that God had you do that terrible thing to me so that I could be here today to do this great thing for you? Don't you see I had to go through all of that misery and all of that pain and all of that suffering so that here today I could save you from this great famine? And I wish I had a heart like Joseph, a heart that looked at all the bad and didn't give up hope, a heart that walked through all the pain and suffering this world could throw and still held firm. God has a plan and I will trust in it. The story continues and his brothers and family, they all move down into Egypt. They move into Egypt so they have food and they're given land to live in and flocks to tend. And things begin to go well for his family and then his dad dies. And his brothers get concerned. See, they understood that Joseph would have mercy on them and treat them well when their dad was alive because he'd do it for his, his sake. But now that their dad was dead, they began to question, will Joseph still treat us well? What will he do to us now? This happens. They come to him with this plea. They cry out in Genesis chapter 50, please have mercy on us. We are your slaves. And that dream he had as a child of them bowing down before him had come true. That very thing God promised years ago before all the suffering and all the pain and all the terrible situations he walked through was coming to pass. It says this, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. See, as the story continues and moves from Abraham into the rest of his descendants and the family and the people of God, there's this profound reality. Our God is more powerful than anything. And our God works in ways we don't always understand. And our God uses terrible situations for his good and his glory. And that doesn't mean our God wants us to experience those things. But in this broken, messy world, God knows we will go through them. And our God is not sitting back every time something bad happens going, Oh, I, I should have been there for that one. 
He's not sitting back going, I wish I could have done something to prevent that. No, our God is actively working in every situation, good and bad, to lead his people to a place of great deliverance. For Joseph, he saw his brothers who'd betrayed him, who'd been the the beginning of the chain of suffering, the beginning of the season of pain. And he didn't hate them. And he wasn't bitter with them. Instead, he offered them something incredible. Forgiveness. And in that very forgiveness, that light of God began to shine in that dark place in them, that place that had led them to do those things. That light and love of God began to move through Joseph to restore even them. This last week, we kicked off the start of Financial Peace University. And in preparation for the start of this class, I was watching a video that Dave Ramsey's made kind of telling his story. If you don't know his story, it's pretty cool. He, as a 25-year-old, had life made, was making almost a quarter of a million dollars from a business he established from the ground up with no help from other people. He was doing incredible things and no fault of his own. Everything started spiraling down. And a couple years later, after losing everything, filed for bankruptcy and started over And in this video, he was talking about his story, and he said something that I thought was so timely. He said, I met God on the way up, but I got to know God on the way down. See, suffering is terrible. And seasons where everything is against us is not good. But there's a promise. In those painful places, in those difficult moments when everything seems against us, We can draw near to God who will never leave us and never forsake us. We can draw near to a God who is powerful enough that even those bad things eventually will be made new and restored and healing will come. Joseph trusted in God in those difficult moments. And while it's not recorded, I imagine some of his prayer life was not that pleasant. See, trusting God in the difficult, painful places doesn't mean it stops hurting. It doesn't mean you say, God, I know you'll take care of this, so who cares? In fact, when we lost our child, we heard from people we love dearly, don't worry, God will give you another one. Don't worry, this child is is no longer suffering. Let me tell you, in that place of pain, those small little platitudes mean nothing. That pain still exists. But in Scripture, there's this prayer that you and I can pray in our time of suffering. When situations seem to be against us, when all of our circumstances are crumbling and falling apart, there's this prayer throughout Scripture called lamenting. And it's really a simple prayer. It goes like this. I'm going to spell out in whatever vulgar, painful, hurtful words I need to before God all of my pain and suffering. I'm going to call him any name, anything I want. I'm going to accuse him for all of this bad. And then I'm going to confess that I'm sinful and in need of him. And then I'm going to declare, even when I don't feel it and experience it, the promises he's made for me and the hope that I have even through all this pain. We see uh, in the Psalms a whole bunch of laments. We see a whole book entitled Lamentations where they're just lamenting of pain. You and I in our suffering are invited to draw near to a God who loves us and to cry out and not define ourselves by the mess we're walking through. Not say, this is just who I am, or this is what I deserve, or it's all your fault, but instead to say, God, you're here, and I need you today. Draw near to me. And this God, he embraces our suffering to the point that he himself came into our brokenness and suffered for us. We don't serve a God who's powerful and has never experienced pain. But we serve a God who took all that pain upon himself and suffered for us that there might be a great deliverance. Just as Joseph's pain led him to that place of praise and brought him to a place where God used him to save a whole nation. The pain and suffering that Jesus went through on that cross was used by God to bring deliverance to not only a whole nation, but all people. That we can draw near to God in times of difficulty. And in times where things are going really well, we can draw near to him and say, it's not me who did this, 
but you who's done it for me. Like Joseph, he could have said, look at how I earned this place by my ability to interpret dreams. But he said, God, you have provided all that I need to be here today. You've given me these blessings and you brought me through those curses. Because there are people in our world and in our city who are going through really, really hard times. And maybe, maybe it's their fault. Maybe they have done something that has brought these hard times upon themselves. Maybe you have done something that has brought hard times upon you. We also have people in our city who've experienced hurt from other people, and it's not their fault. They did nothing to deserve it. They did not earn it. It wasn't because of the way they were dressed or the actions they chose, but bad things happened to them. And God still loves them. And you and I, as the people of God, get to be those who shine light into darkness. That for people who are hurting and people who are suffering and people who are experiencing bad things and they don't know that God loves them, we get to say there's hope and there's a promise that all of this will someday be made new. Let me grieve with you and walk with you and care for you in this pain. Let me celebrate with you when things are going well. If you're here today and things are going really bad or they're going really well, I want to give you this challenge. This week, just try it for seven days and see what happens. Whether things are going really, really bad or whether they're going really, really good, Every meal, so three times a day, sit down and write down one thing you're thankful for. God, today I'm thankful for what? If things are really bad, today I'm thankful that this suffering will end. Today I'm thankful that you are still God. Whatever it is you're thankful for. See, if you write down one thing at every meal, by the end of the week you have a whole list of things to say, God, no matter my circumstance, no matter my situation, you are with me. And a whole list of things to say, God, help me to see your blessing and your hand leading and guiding even when things fall apart. See, if we as his people begin to see that it's not about what we go through. It's not about what we've experienced. It's about the God who experiences it with us. The God who walks through everything we go through for us. See, if we begin to fix our mind on that, even the things you deserve, he forgives. And the things you don't deserve, he promises to restore. And the things you've worked hard for, he promises to use for those who don't yet know his love. And we together with this mind that says, it's not what we go through or what's coming, but the God who loves us. We get to be a light to the city that is hurting. Real quick as I end, uh, many of you t yesterday, those of you who like college football, got to uh, kick off the start of a new college football season. And it might not have gone so well if you're a Vols fan. went great if you're a West Virginia fan. Um, I was really looking forward to kicking off the Husker season. And then a big storm came through Lincoln, and the game got canceled. And so we didn't get to even watch the team hopefully win. It's a bummer. But I saw a video this morning on Facebook that really brought me great joy. See 90,000 fans in the stands uh, as the rain was coming down and they were bummed they weren't watching the game. Uh, they began to turn on music over the speakers and people just started singing and having a good time. And this video that I saw today was a video of 90,000 people all together singing Don't Stop Believing by Journey. And you can only imagine that 90,000 people who wanted to cheer for a football game that are getting rained on in the lightning and the storm are like, well, we might as well sing loud and boisterous here. And it was pretty neat to watch this loud video of people singing, don't stop believing, as they're standing in a storm and rain is coming down and life is a mess and things aren't going as planned. Don't stop believing. For you and I today, whatever that storm is, wherever you're at, good or bad, this is what God's saying to us. Don't stop believing. Look, I'm here with you, and I'm for you, and I will turn even this mess into praise.